Hello and welcome back to the Russian Football News Podcast. This week we'll return to European matters as we had three big games in which we actually had some successes for the first time in quite some time and two out of three wins and we all hoped for that third but unfortunately couldn't quite just get there in the end. First of all, Zenit St. Petersburg hosted uh, Malmo at the Gazprom Arena on Wednesday night, and they won quite convincingly with a 4 0 victory. Spartak somehow defeated Napoli 3 2 away from home on Thursday in the Europa League. And then also on Thursday in the Europa League in Italy, Lokomotiv fell as 2 0 to a 2 0 loss against Maurizio Sarri's Lazio. We'll be discussing all of that before giving a quick summary right at the end of the latest uh, under-21 Russia squad. To do so, of course, I'm as always joined by David. Evening, evening. And from the WTI podcast, I think what is your first appearance on the RFN pod this season is Hanu. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is, I think, my first appearance of the season. And I'm glad that it comes at a time where I have reason to be positive and happy. <laughs> Uh, and it's a welcome departure from my recent mood on uh, the other podcast, which has been quite uh, groggy, to say the least. So, yeah, excited to break that down today. Yeah, I thought we would get us both in and we can outnumber David and talk talk some Spartak as well. And while, like you say, we're actually in, in good spirits for what seems like the first time in, in quite some time. But yeah. first of all, we'll jump straight to the Zenit match, which took place, as I mentioned, on Wednesday night. Uh, Zenit hosted Malmo in the Gazprom Arena and lined up with the side of Klitsiok in goal. Uh, Barrios, Chistyakov and Rakitsky in a three, and then Sutomin, Kuzyaev, Wendell and Santos in a four, with Malcolm, Z- Malcolm Zuber and Claudinho up top. Zenit romped to a 4 nil win with goals from Claudinho, Kuzyaev, an excellent one from Sutomin, and then Wendell finished it off right at the death. So, David, you watched the entirety of the game and kept a close eye on all the goings on. How did how did you think about Zenit? And just a far cry from last year, I presume. Yeah, it was it was very comfortable for for Zenit for the most part. Um, you know, they they dominated play uh, for almost all the game, other than a short spell in in the first half. Um, got got an early goal, obviously through Claudinho. Nicely worked move and a good finish. Um, We'll see with Asmoon out injured, they are playing Zuba uh, up top with with the two Brazilians off him and it it worked well in the league recently against Rubin uh, and it worked well again this time. You know, Malmo had had their little spell um, but then it ended the half strong and uh, it went in at at 1-0 and then second half... uh, they got their they got their second goal quite early on through Kuzayev. Kuzayev, I thought, was one of the best players for Zenit on the night. Just a, a classic Kuzayev performance. You know, worked hard, was all over the place, running around, um, just doing doing all the things he needed to do correctly. Um, and then the red card came after that for Malmo. It, it was it was harsh, I think. Um, I assume the criteria being that he was he was last man, although he was you know, at least thirty yards from goal. Um, but it was a, it was an accidental handball. His his arms are up, and because I tried to flick it over him and it hit his arm, he wasn't going directly at the goal. But uh, you know they they gave it, um, and from then on it was, you know I, I can only remember once or twice that that Malmo really got in the opponents uh, in Zenit's half after that. Um, and they and they just cruised it, you know. So Tom in scored his 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 really good goal. Uh, then they, you know, made Zenit made all their changes as Moon came on. You know, the usual suspects came on. Uh, you know, Mostovoy, Krugovoy, Karasov. Uh, yeah, and then Wendell 
got a, a rebound off Has Moon's shot at the end. He, he probably should have passed it. There was a free chance, but he got away with it and uh, had a Wendell had a tap in for himself. Um, so yeah, very very routine Malmo. Malmo just couldn't couldn't get into the game. Zenit played well. Obviously, switching back to their their uh, um, was it a four? I don't think it was a four. I think I think it was still a five again. I can't remember. Um, I, I wanted to say that Barrios was quite deep at times, but uh, I think it, it was a five. It, it was so comfortable that uh, you know, it didn't really matter where he was playing. He was sometimes he was in the opponent's box. Sometimes I remember him being in defence. Um, you know, there, there was not really a bad performance out there on on the pitch from a, from a Zenit player. I didn't think. Um, I didn't think Wendell. I thought had one of his quieter games, but he obviously ended it with a goal. Uh, so yeah, uh, <laughs> very nice to have a a stress free evening for a Russian football club. You know, at half time. It, you felt comfortable, but obviously it was just a one goal gap, and sort of you know within twenty minutes we it was cruising, um, and, a, and a, yeah, an easy win. So um, you know it was a must win game in theory, the easiest game of their group, uh, and they did it with a plum. So hats off to them. Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt, I think this is a game last year that Zenit probably wouldn't have got three points from. Certainly wouldn't have dominated in the way that they did with the. What was it dominating just about every single metric up for grabs apart from goalkeeper saves uh, and certainly wouldn't have scored four goals. But I think that's credit to Semak. He's learning on the job and will constantly learn on the job. Everyone does in football. But last year, he more often than not played the the old two banks of four with the two strikers and Zuba and Asmoon up top. And that either left them just far too open in defence against the better sides and against sides like Ghent um, they weren't able to exert control so it's really nice to see from these two performances so far, yes they lost against Chelsea but they put in a gutsy performance, defended well for the vast majority and it was just one mistake unfortunately that was the undoing and um, Lukaku's absolute brutish power and strength that just as as you always see from him. And then the second game, like it was you said, David, they just controlled everything in a in a really professional manner. Um I thought Wendell was absolutely fantastic. That combination of a as you said, Barrios, I think playing in a three, but obviously pushes forward so much as him on the right and Yarakitsky on the left's job to progress the ball and protect Chistyakov to an extent, because Chistyakov he's not the worst on the ball, but he's obviously not at the same level as Barrios and Rakitsky. So his job is to stop by while the other two push on so high. And I thought Rakitsky had a great game. Uh, it's good to see him. He, he's been a little bit in and out of form um, this season. I mean, in and out of form for him is still a very high level. But it's good to see him getting his foot on the ball and really uh, creating again um, from from deep, from a deep position, which helps Zenit so much. And I just think they looked so balanced. I agree. I think this formation of Malcolm and Claudinho since they first played that with Zuba against Rubin. They've looked very nicely balanced and uh, hopefully can be auspicious signs because I think they could, obviously this puts gives them a very good platform to get third in what is a, a very difficult group. But Hanu, you have been oh, banging the drum for Alexis Otoman at wing back slash right back for quite some time. And he obviously got his first goal of any kind in European football. Just how impressed were him? Were you by him? And do you think that he could potentially make that position his own for Russia? Um, yeah, I think there's no reason for him not to do that because I think uh, his only direct competitor right now would be Karagayev, who has not been playing for a while. I don't know why that is. Uh, Mario retired and we do have other right backs, um, Orson Adamov and even though despite uh, all the grief he gets, I think Nikolai Raskozov isn't that bad of a football player but of course seeing them in a Russia setup I think he has a fair bit of a way to go before he can do that uh, but yeah I mean so Dorman's adapted to the role very well um, it's hard for him as a winger to be one of the leading players in his position in the league because of how many wingers we have but at fullback I think it's a lot easier for him to be his own player and to sort of seize the initiative um, but yeah, he was pretty impressive from what I saw. I think the entire Zenit team was pretty impressive. They deserve credit for that result. 
you've been pretty critical about um, them in Europe in the past. But with Malcolm Claudinho, um, Wendell, Marios, all of these players, they seem to be gelling very well. They seem to be playing pretty well. So, yeah, it's good for them. It's good for the coefficient. And I hope that they can uh, at least finish third now. Yeah, hopefully. I think this is also Zenit's biggest ever win in the Champions League, if I rem- yeah, remember is. correctly. And uh, David, you've been really complimentary of Wendell, and I think he had a 100% pass completion rate against Malmo in the game. And then, obviously, his late goal was a little bit of a tap-in laid on a plate from the rebound off Asmund's shot. But are you excited to see more of Wendell? And do you think he could... Him coming in, obviously, last year has helped Semak ease that decision of dropping Barrios a little bit deeper. I think I think with players like Wendell, Claudinho, Barrios, Douglas, um, and to a, to a degree Malcolm, obviously you've got five South Americans there, four of them Brazilian, um, uh, and that's a really solid core to that to that team. You know, I. I They've added a fourth Brazilian in Claudinho. And I get sort of in my head the odd comparison to like, well, they're becoming a bit shat RSK, you know, with all the Brazilians they're getting. And they're actually playing well, these Brazilians. You know, is any South American transit history is, is a mixed bag. Uh, but Claudinho clearly is a huge upgrade on Driussi, I think. Uh, I know it's early days, but it seems like he offers so much more than Driussi did for, for Zeni, in my opinion. Uh, and Wendell... I just think uh, in that role that he has, which is sort of box to box, essentially, is what he is what he's been given to do. He's he's given quite a free role, but he's he's a box to box. He'll get forward, he'll get back. Barrios is obviously the cruncher, you know, the defensive machine. Kuzayev or well, Kuzayev predominantly is that guy. If it, if Ozdoy was fit, you know, those two guys would be given the job of doing a lot of the running. Kuzayev obviously appears all over the pitch. Mendel is is. Uh, I think one of the best players in the league uh, on his day. Um, I think you, you know if we were doing rankings, I think I would certainly put him in my top ten uh, best players in the, in the RPL, um, close probably to top to the top five. Um, yeah, I, I just think he's he's been a great great signing. Obviously, they, they spent a bit of money on him, but in in the guys like him and Claudinho, you, you've got players there where you can actually see Zenit could make some profit. Obviously, Malcolm will exclude from that because they spent forty million to get him in. But I think Malcolm's signing was still important because it was that Malcolm was coming in with all the Argentines, so he was not too uncomfortable there. Douglas was already there, I think, so they they had a Brazilian link. And then when they were Taldini have come in as a result of the, the Brazilian base that was already there, I think that was definitely a good help as to to bringing those two in. Um, yeah, and they've got this little this little group who are playing incredibly well. You know, all, all four of those and the Colombian Barrios are playing really well consistently. Barrios we saw linked to uh, Atletico Madrid, I think, in, in the week as well, which should be no surprise. You know, we all we all think he's you know, an absolutely top class defensive midfielder. Um, but yeah, I think I think Wendell is is uh, in his position in in Russia, certainly one of, one of the best. I think he's really adapted well to to the team. Yeah, yeah, certainly. It's it's nice to see him taking up that that playmaking role and really coming into his own in in Zenit's midfield. Um, on quickly on Driussi, as you mentioned him. Uh, oh, I, I agree. I think Claudinho has been a far better suited replacement in that position. Um, I spoke to one of the guys from the Scuffed Pod, that's at Scuffed Pod on Twitter, and they're basically um, US football experts, uh, the men's national team, women's national team, and the NWSL and MLS, of course. And for Austin, I think Trelucy's got six, I think they said like six goals and assists and like nine starts for them. Um, but he's not playing out wide or as a striker, he's actually playing as a number 10, and he is like the playmaker in the team. So maybe Zenit could have played him in that position, but to do so, you have to either yeah. take one of Asmoon and Zuba out of the side, which just was not going to happen well, any time yeah. in the last two years. The funny thing with Jerusi is that when he came across from Argentina, he was in Argentina. He was a he was a poacher. He was an Asmoon style striker. Um, I, I remember hearing that his record in, in Argentina was that he'd never scored from outside the box. You know, he was he was just that sort of striker. Um, but because of Zuba and Asmoon, he 
ended up being shifted, you know, to, to, to fit him into the pitch. You know, they, they shifted him into a, a wide player and sometimes he played centrally behind, but predominantly out, out on the left. Um, no, not as a, obviously, as a conventional winger, you know. He was he was an attack. He was essentially a striker, but just playing in the left channel um, or, you know, an attacking midfielder playing in the left channel. But he, he certainly wasn't playing as a winger. Um, but because he he converted to that position from you know, a central striking role, a limited striking role, I, I just think it didn't. You know, he had the quality to to play there because he's still a good player. But Cody, you know, is a guy who excels there in, like, in comparison. So um, I think it's just you know you've got a is it be like signing a guy on FM and immediately retraining him to. To play on the left wing, that's what they did with the Juicy. Whereas Claudio, you know, he's really made for it. Yeah, yeah, I like that analogy. I think it's maybe it was this, the cards were stacked against Juicy to an extent, and then obviously, whenever he gets the the very rare chance, a player like that who is more so a poacher, more than anything, needs minutes, regular minutes on a pitch to really get in the top form. Um, I'm, I've, I've partly got the, the opinion that. Drusy was just never greatly suited to Zenit, and it was more so a signing that was made without doing the adequate research. Um, whether or not that's true is impossible to say from the outside looking in. But like I say, from the outside looking in, that's exactly how how it how it looks. Um, one last thing on Zenit, Hanu. Do you obviously in the Chelsea game, uh, Semak started with the same back ten in the same formation, obviously, but with Azamun uh, up front on his own flanked by Malcolm and Claudinho. Of course, with his injury um, in the RPL games, last three RPL games, and in the Malmo game, that was Zuber up top, uh, with Asmoon returning to fitness and obviously coming on late in the game. Uh, do you think he might return to a four four two or stick with what he's changed to, which has been successful so far? And if he does stick with the three, uh, two starts, Asmoon and Zuber, We've traditionally seen Semak play with both uh, Azmoon and Zuba, and that's been sort of a uh, an unchanging factor, no matter who plays in the midfield or who plays in the defence, those two start up front. But I think that has limited them in the past. With uh, They, of course, complement each other very well. But if you find a way to stop them, then Zenit are basically toothless. But now that they're sort of embracing the two very talented wingers that they have, and treating them as their main creative outlets as opposed to Zuba's um, very one-dimensional set of skills. I think that's only going to help them both in the league and in Europe. So, yeah, I think it's for the best that they stick to whatever uh, they found right now. And I think that is what will continue to happen. Speaking of the elite level, um, Spartak aren't there yet and haven't been for some time. But they did play to a little bit more of an elite level by defeating Napoli 3-2 in Napoli on Thursday evening. Uh, this was actually Napoli's first defeat of the season in all competitions, including uh, a game already played against England's Leicester City in in the Europa League groups. Uh, to quickly just summarise, uh, it was Maximenka in goal, a back three of Kofrier, Gijo, uh, Zikia, and then Moses, Litvinov, Bakayev, Umyarov and Ayrton, with Ponser and Promes up top. Um, it was a pretty eventful match. Um, Macedonian Elif Elmas scored, what is it, the second fastest, was it agreed? We both agree on the second fastest goal in the Europa League. After just 11 seconds, um, Mario Rui was sent off via VAR. Um, there was an absolute boatload of yellow cards, I think, including nine given to Spartak alone. Just before half time, um, Promise Quincy Promise won a, a penalty, and then in the forty fifty second minutes, that penalty was overruled by VAR. And then in the second half, there was four more goals, another red card when Maximiliano Cofrier got his second yellow of the game, and finally Spartak ran out as three two winners after there were over a hundred minutes played. So. Hanu, absolutely crazy game, but I can imagine you're pretty delighted at the result. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go on one of uh, a classic RFN monologues here and talk about this game for at least an hour. Um, but no, this was this was amazing. Not only from um, 
the perspective of, of covering it and whatnot, because that comes with its whole set of challenges and emotions and so on, which was unlike anything I've uh, felt in a very, very long time, maybe ever. But purely from the perspective of fan, I've not celebrated a victory like this in football in a, a really long time. I think maybe Real Madrid Champions League final in 2018 was the last time that degree of emotion was present in me with regards to a football game. Um, but no, th- th- this game had uh, everything. It was chaotic from the 12th second, like you said. It was very feisty. It was really slow-paced and it's like sluggish in a sense. But it wasn't. It wasn't like because, because Napoli. You have to agree that Napoli are. Yeah. I believe Napoli have the highest market value of any side in the Europa League. Six wins out of six in the Europa League unbeaten um, players are all on great form very high quality team and nobody gave us any sort of a chance and even we weren't too optimistic about the result but to go down after a minute and then come back the way we did huge moment for Mikhail Ignatov um, scoring what was basically the winning goal Quincy promise was phenomenal and it was just very um we we needed that desperately because of you know the start to the season has been far from rosy, so to get that sort of statement victory under the belt, especially with um, injuries, with suspensions, with all of those things, the team wasn't our strongest eleven. But yeah, it was just it was a great display of character, a great display of um, tactical resilience, a great effort from from everyone involved, and I hope that it sets the sets the stone, sets the precedent for the rest of the season and our Europa League campaign because we sort of have a chance now, somewhat. It's still still tough. But um, like even Akmat on Sunday will be pretty tough because they're a tough side to play against and we have a lot of injuries. But yeah, I hope this is the start of uh, a calmer period, a more successful period for us this season because our run is quite insane. Uh, I think we're playing... Zenit, Krasnodar, Rostov, Dinamo, maybe even Loco, Leicester City twice in the space of the next 10 games. So we need all the luck and, and the best that we can get. So, yeah, I mean, phenomenal victory, honestly. <laughs> yeah, just to quickly go over the that full list of results, it is right. It's first, it's Akhmat away, Dinamo at home, Leicester at home, Zenit away, Rostov, bit of a calm one there. And then Leicester away, Loco at home, Krasnodar away, Napoli at home, Ufa, which is Spartak's generally famous bogey team. And then Ahmat and Len Legia Led- again before, then that's the end of the group stages. So it's going to be a, a pretty horrific next, what, two months, give it take for Spartak in terms of the difficulty of games. But these, yeah. they, this, they should relish this Spartak. One thing that, I mean, I like to jump on the Spartak hate quite a lot, and I am a Spartak fan, the, the it's more so frustration rather than hatred when Spartak are shit. But Gijo, Jikia, uh, Victor Moses, Promes, Ayet, and they're all big characters and players who you'd hope would relish in playing these games. And Spartak have more often than not in recent years, or at least under Tedesco, um, death without a shadow of a doubt, performed higher in the higher pressure games, performed better in the bigger games. Yeah. Um, and I'll eat my hat a little bit and I'll give Rui Vittoria a little bit of credit because to not only go to Napoli, yes, Mario Rui sending off did change the game to an extent, but they went to Napoli, was down within 11 seconds of the match. Vittoria got a yellow card before the 11-second goal even went in. He got yellow card that early on the bench. With a midfield, in, in, including Ruslan Litvinov, who's very, very inexperienced, a bench with... Ilya Gapanov, Mikhail Ignatov, Alexander Lomovitsky, Stepan Melnikov in there, who are either very young players or, in Lomovitsky's case, just nowhere near good enough to play at this level of football. Give them credit because they did turn up and if it, it could have been more... It should have really been more comfortable, but I think the, the nature of the game, as I said, nine Spartak yellow cards, uh, four... Napoli yellow cards plus Mario Rui's red card because it was scrappy like that it actually played into Spartak's hands a little bit um, Spartak especially Zizio, Zhiki and Omiarov are, are, are happy to play that that scrappier game and that really 
stifles Napoli a little bit. I, I agree. I think they are one of, if not the best, in terms of just pound for pound quality throughout the side in the Europa League this season. Um, so absolute highest praise to them. And and Promes obviously got two goals. The first one was, I mean, to say it's a little bit lucky is an understatement. I think it deflected to him and twice and then his shot was deflected in. But Spartak deserved it at the time. And I think Promes's general play is arguably some of the best we've seen since his return. Obviously, he's had a lot of off-field issues. And that's of that's taken its toll, but because of the quality of the opposition, because of the level of the game, that's the best that I've I've that we could arguably seen him play so far. Um, are you, honey? Were you a little bit worried about Maxi's mistakes? Because I think uh, Alexi in our RFN chat summed it up pretty well. Where he's either very good, but then has that howler in him. Are, are you worried that they, they do continue? Because we've been talking about this for quite some time now, and I know. A couple of other Russian football commentators really, really do not rate Maximenko whatsoever. Yeah, I think um, I think I've also mostly last season and the season before that I've talked about this general tendency among uh, Russian goalkeepers, whether it be Safonov, Maximenko, or whoever, to be capable of the spectacular on their day, but then also make uh, a pretty tragic error. But I think Maximenko has just slowly and surely ironed those uh, mistakes out of his game. I, I mean, the goal yesterday was poor on his behalf. But before that, I can't remember uh, a conspicuous mistake that he made. And I think he's been generally pretty good. So I'm willing to let him off on, on uh, that one. I guess he's been one of our better performers in what has been a very inconsistent season so far. So... Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I hope he gets better as uh, better and better as time goes on. But I, I think he's fairly good right now. I, I wouldn't worry too much. Yeah, Mac, Max, he's still only 23. And I've, I do have patience for young goalkeepers. He's, like I said, his ceiling's quite high. He performs very well. He's He's kept Spartak in the game many times this season. I think this is, as you said, he's, he's first... Uh, direct error leading to a goal and he's kept what three clean sheets and made some absolutely brilliant saves so I will I mean Ufa at the weekend he was, he was excellent against Ufa I think he was one of Spartak's highest rated players despite winning 2-0 so I do have that patience with him because of his age um, so those at RFN we've been criticised a little bit for maybe potential double standards regarding Maximenko's mistakes Safonov's less often mistakes too in comparison to Guillaume's. Um Guillaume, like Maxi, has been... I mean, we'll get more into him later, but he has been quite consistent this season, by and large. But that patience erodes when it's such a glaring error from a goalkeeper who's been making glaring errors for well over a decade now. Yeah, he might be great for six games, but it's been well over 10 years of constant howlers. And that's where the patience does run out. I, and it, it's because Maximenko and Safanov are younger is why you give them that leeway because they're still learning their trade. Um, when they maybe two three years time when they're far more experienced, then it'll become a, a worry. Right now, it's another pattern, a black spot to add to a developing pattern. But he's got time on his sides to hopefully develop it out of his game. Uh, David, what do you think about Spartak coming from a less biased or non, totally non-biased subjective point of view? Do you think we're maybe giving him a little bit too much credit here or did the red card really change the game in their favour? I mean, I I think it's a bit of both. So obviously the, red, the, the goal came super early and the red card came in, what, the 40th or the 35th minute or something like that. Um... Up until that point, I think Napoli had only had one really good chance to go to double their lead, uh, and Spartak had not been um, terrible going forward. They'd ha- they'd had some chances. I think had it stayed at eleven v eleven um, from that point, it would have it would have been a very tough game. Uh, I expect Napoli would have scored, um, 
but Spartak weren't out of the game bad. You know, they they'd kept it going for half an hour without really having too much problem. I say there was that one chance. I think it was Zelensky stuck it over the bar um, from nearly from like the edge of the box. Um, so they they were handling themselves okay. You know, excluding that. You know, if you ignored the first ten seconds. Um, up to the point with the red card, it was nil-nil deservedly. Uh, but the red card definitely allowed the game to open up. You know, Spartak became the dominant side on the ball, were able to push forward, you know, eventually get their goal, um, and, you know, force Napoli to, to come at them for the win. You know, they, they had rotated a little bit their side, but they, they brought some stronger players on with Simen in the second half. Um, but Spartak did it. They they took advantage, and the the second goal was so. Well, I've watched it back a couple of times. So it was really really well worked. Um, you know, someone I can't remember even who picks it up. Um, because you can maybe it. It might have been Imyarov. You know, someone picked it up. Gets a really good overlap from Ayrton, and we know how quick Ayrton is. Ayrton's so deep when the ball's played, but he gets there before the the Napoli defender. Ignatov carries his run on, Bakayev dummies the ball, uh, and it's a great finish from the edge of the box. Um, and then the last goal, Mjarov was great, and you know, he picked up uh, an exceptional loose ball, two really good bits of skill to first beat first defender, which I think was Koulibaly, uh, and then the second one to nip it into Sobolev, uh, you know, for the for the eventual tap-in. Um, but no, I think, you know, the, the red card was was a gift for them, but they took advantage of it really well. There were some great performances out there. I think, you know, Ponce was a force change. He, he's hurt his knee. I think he's out for a, well, undetermined amount of time, but seemingly a couple of months by the sounds of it. Um, but I think Soblev had a big impact on the game. I think it was a good swap. Um, even if it was forced, I think it was actually, it worked out for them. Uh, and there were plenty of good performances. You know, both the midfielders, or Ayrton and Litvinov, were both excellent. Not Ayrton, sorry, um, Yarov and uh, Litvinov were both excellent in midfield. Um, you know, Moses, Ayrton, Price, uh, you know, they, everyone was good. Uh, everyone did a really good job on the day. Um, you know, they they, put, they were putting in a fair number of challenges. You know, as you said, 13 yellow cards in total. Uh, a lot of them a lot of them came late on when they were trying to stop uh, Napoli from, from countering and trying to get back into the game. Uh, and the Napoli, I mean, I don't watch a lot of Italian football, but they were the bench was an, as animated as you might expect. Uh, and I didn't know if that was normal or just because Spartak were riling them up. Either way, it was quite nice to see. Um, but yeah, it was it was a good performance. You know, they were handed a chance, like you know, red card. Here you go, go at them, and they did it. So fair play to them. Yeah, certainly fair play. I, I think I just wanted to temper our optimism a little bit because. We don't really want to get ourselves carried away. It's just one game. Um, but because of such underperformance from Russian sides in general for so long in Europe, I think it's fair to get a little bit excited and to enjoy enjoy the good times when, when it is good. Because, I mean, as Hanu, you mentioned, that this results came without Roman Zobnin, who's vitally important in midfield. Uh, Pasha Maslov's injured, Jora Tendricks not quite as important. Um, and Jordan Larson, who's absolutely vital. They're all, they all missed the game. Uh, Georgi Melkadze missed the game as well, um, probably for the best, in my opinion, in, the, in that regard. But because of that, they had a a very limited bench. As you mentioned, Litvinov was starting. Those players who wouldn't... I mean, Bakayev was completely out of the squad this time last year, and he's, he's having a little bit of resurgence under Vittoria. So Vittoria, do you think... I mean, he's been under... Quite a little bit of pressure of late. Um, lots of sources in the Russian press, as we've covered in the past, have, have mentioned that his his job's on the line. But uh, rumours claim that due to various contract clauses, that he cannot be sacked before a certain date. And um, now, obviously, ignoring the rumours, Hanu, do you think that this is a little bit of a lifeline for Vittoria? This could potentially be him to maybe turn things around in his time at Spartak? I know he, he's he been a little bit more animated and trying to demand some respect in, in the press conferences. So do you think that he he could do it or or not? Or is the writing maybe still on the wall? Yeah, focusing purely on his managerial acumen and what the future might look for him, I think 
this match certainly proves that he is indeed uh, a good manager because this was, and he made it a point to say in the press conference that this was not purely an emotional victory. We played really well. We played tactically. We outplayed Napoli and we deserved what we got from it. And even in his press conferences, even in all of his communications, he has shown a remarkable resilience despite um, all the turmoil that has, has surrounded the club. And purely on the pitch, we've seen that Spartak have been in and around the top of all your XG charts and all your XP charts. And a lot of the losses have been very cruel to take, perhaps against the run of play, like the Legia game, like to some extent um, the Rubin game. To some extent, a couple of other, the CSKA game, obviously. So, we've just been um, woefully unlucky in the start of the season. But the the patterns are there. The promise is there. Um, a couple of players, once they're back from injury, hopefully we can build on in, in January in the transfer window. But I think Rui Pretoria has at least shown with this game because this is a remarkable result regardless of the circumstance we would be top of if we were top of the league even then we would be um, expecting a loss from whatever against a team like napoli so yeah i think it's a it's a great result and i think that personally purely subjectively i think he has uh, what it takes to build a pretty decent team and i hope we can we can continue and we can build on that yeah i think so david what do you think of Victoria? Is this maybe where you could turn it around? Um, yeah, possibly. I mean, it's all going to depend on what Fedun's thinking. You know, maybe he's already made his mind up. I, I can see him being a man who doesn't change his mind once he's decided on something. Um, but actually, I, I had interjected because uh, I was just looking at some some goalkeeper numbers. So. Uh, Last three years, since September 2018, I've just pulled up some numbers. Errors directly leading to goals from Guillermo, Maximenko, and Safonov. Maximenko has 11 errors leading to goals. Safonov has 13. Guillermo has 21. So, uh, in that's amazing. Three I mean, years. Mate, yeah, since it's first September 2018 until today. Jesus. That's so that's, that's 87 matches for Guillermo, 83 for Maximenko, and 72 for Safonov. So, um, yeah, I think I that some other doubts, goalkeepers, uh, but uh, those are obviously the big three. Yeah, no, I think we will talk about Gilem and sorry to go off the script here, but um, not not only is Gilherm a, a very shocking and inconsistent goalkeeper, he is a danger to society, a menace <laughs> on the pitch. <laughs> um, I don't understand how someone can defend that man, honestly, because. That game against Spartak, which we lost uh, 2 and 3 or whatever it was, he put in the performance of his life. Fair enough to him. That performance, he gives us a couple of good performances every year, but you think that he's the best goalkeeper in the world. But um, this season already, he had two howlers in the Russian Super Cup. He had another howler against Zenit. And most recently, against Kimki, he tried to take away Kamal Ademi's manhood and his life by what was a truly shocking like just kung fu kick at his groin and he's been red carded or he's been uh, suspended for two games which i think is quite scandalous so yeah i mean a lot of goalkeepers make errors they're not exempt from them but gilherm just uh, shows a distinct lack of respect not only for the laws of goalkeeping but also for humanity and i think that needs to be taken into account <laughs> It's true. I just pulled up Akinfeyev is 11 for comparison. Um, Akinfeyev who never makes a mistake. So Akinfeyev, if we combine errors and errors leading to goals, Akinfeyev has 15 total. Guillermo has 32 total. Maximenko has 18 total. And Safonov has 17. So, uh, yeah. Guillermo almost double everyone else in terms of errors in the last three years. I'm going to potentially look into goalkeepers aside from just them and, and see who has the least and I wouldn't be surprised if it was someone like Yuri Jupin um, maybe one of the less check. heralded keepers who is equally as talented because before we do quickly go on a local I'll, I'll just quickly end with, with 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 the Russian goalkeeping situation that we've kind of I, I personally find baffling 
Um, he calls up five goalkeepers to every squad, despite the fact he's got the, he's yeah. got the same amount of goalkeepers than he does strikers. Only plays Guillaume pretty much, and who's the maybe fourth best out of the bunch. And then when asked about it, he actually says that he's not in charge and doesn't make that decision. He's the manager of the national team. I, yeah. How can he not be in charge and make that decision? This is why in a year's time when his contract's up, he's not going to be getting the job regardless of how well he does. Carpin's not the long-term man in charge. Guillaume certainly isn't the long-term option in goal. All over the rest of the pitch in Russia in general, not just for the national team, but amongst clubs, you are seeing a little bit of a transformation where there are the, the squads in general are getting younger and younger. David, you have the numbers as well, where there's more and more players of a certain age playing regular football week in, week out. More and more academy players playing week in, week out at an earlier age. And Guillaume's just like the immovable object that's been there for about 10 years and been exactly the same for about 10 years. But this is starting to turn from a gripe into a witch hunt. So, David, do you have, do you, have you potentially got those numbers or should we move on and revisit it later? Uh, yeah. We can revisit it. I actually just noted that uh, the numbers I gave you just from the last two years. So that's 32 mistakes in two seasons. But I will do three seasons and come back to it in a bit. That's brilliant. But yeah, sorry, James, to cut you off again. Promise my last point that's off topic. Uh, Carpin squads are, are really egregious to me because, first of all, this uh, idea of the provisional squad has taken away the entire meaning of a squad. I believe he called up 35 people to his uh, Russian national team, which takes away the point of that because there are maybe 40 to 45 players in the entirety of Russia that would be in contention. So, like, at this point, I don't know how much he's going to expand those squads. There's no real, like, I don't know. I don't know why the squads are so big. There needs to be a cap on that. Even the match day squads, the final squads are, like, 28 men. And only 23 can be in an actual game squad. Mm. So, I, I don't know what he's playing at. But it's it's just very baffling uh, in, in, in every sense of the word. Yeah, it's it's baffling. That's exactly it. I... I looked at it from the point of view that maybe he's experimenting, but you don't experiment by calling up Denis Glushikov. I mean, maybe Glushikov <laughs> deserves the call up potentially with his six goals this season, but it's Glushikov. Do you, is he the future of the team? Carpen's remit is in the short term to lead a transitional period away from the errors of the Churchesov era, which was basically being too conservative in the football and the selection. That's what he's doing. He's just the, the hatchet man in between to to allow whoever the long-term successor is to get an easier easier whip at it, basically. So he, instead of being experimental, he just comes across as totally slapdash. It's like he's he's not aiming for anything. It, it looks like he's not aiming for anything, but just like like the old aphorism of throwing 10, dart, 10 darts at a dartboard and hoping one sticks, basically. But I mean, he was the same at Bartak, so we will move on to the last game um, because we kind of always finish <laughs> off with less about Loco, but I think that's maybe just because Loco are a little bit boring. Um, well, but no, just Loco... more about how Gia may cost Loco another game. <laughs> exactly, thank you. There you go. So from, as David said, from one uh, topic of where Guillermo caused an error, let's go direct to Lazio Lokomotiv. Now, Lazio did win out 2-0 in the end. Um, Loco's side was largely as expected with the man himself, Captain Ingle. Uh, back four, Zhivogliadov, uh, Dima Baranov moving into midfield because of an injury crisis. Eh, in the centre-back, sorry, from midfield due to an injury crisis. Uh, he's partnered by Pablo and then Dimitri Ravchinsky at left-back. Uh, three of Konstantin Maradashvili, Daniel Kulikov and Alexis Bekabaka. And then up top was Rifat, Smolov, and Faustino and, and Joran. On paper, a very talented side, but glaring emissions in there. Um, in particular, Barinov. Barinov performed well, um, was arguably Loco's best performing defender defensively to an extent. But his, in my opinion, his influence in the middle was sorely missed. And it was in midfield where Loco really did lose the battle. Um Lazio just absolutely dominated them and were a class above playing that Sarri ball. And you need competitive midfielders in there. 
Uh, Toma Basic and Patrick scored two early goals for Lazio, who go two up after 38 minutes, both from both headers. So I admittedly um, turned the game off with about 30 minutes left. David, how far through did you actually get? Uh, about half time. <laughs> uh, well, well, I, I definitely stopped paying attention as much once Guillermo did his thing. Uh, and then I definitely switched off at about half time. Yes. Do you what? What do you think about the game? Was it maybe just Sarri's class, uh, or I mean, Loco shooting themselves in the foot a little bit? We were we, we chatted a bit last night, and obviously Loco had their you know Lazio were very good for the opening period of the game. But uh, did I say Lazio? That's who I meant to say anyway. Uh, but Loco had that spell, sort of I don't know twenty to thirty minutes that that sort of ten minutes of the game where they were getting a bit of confidence. They were getting forward a bit. And there was one chance which we also just well, which I mentioned to you, and you had also seen it. Where Smolov uh, he had Anjori in acres on the left, and all he had to do was just dink it over, you know, just play a just simple lofty ball over to switch. You know, it's no more than a twenty to thirty yard pass, and uh, you know, Anjori's got a free run into the box for probably a shot, but uh, for whatever reason, he tried a through ball into a. I, I presume it was Rifat and. Uh, you know, it didn't work, and that that was really it wasn't even a chance because he didn't take that he didn't take that option. Um, that was the best opening that they could have had all game. I think Andorian had one good run where he got a shot off in the end, but uh, you know, if they could have gone in at half time at one nil, I may I may have carried on, but um, because they you know they were easing their way back into it, and you know you never know what can happen in football, but. Second half, uh, well, before the second half came along, obviously that corner comes in. Obviously, a player went for it at the near post and didn't get any touch on it, and Guillermo just did not react, and it just went in that his arms are out. It just went in that gap between his arm and his torso, and hit Patrick in the, or I think in the torso, just hit him and he went straight in. So, um, you know, it it is what it is, but I, I thought. In the opening 20 minutes, I was bemoaning the decision not to play Kirk or Kamano because it was a Lazio domination like a counter style and they didn't have their two quickest attackers on the pitch to, to counter, which, you know, we, we've seen Kamano, Riffat and Smolov link up really well and obviously gave on and Jor in the nod, but I think having one of those two wingers, Kamano, preferably, um, may have just given them a different out ball for, for that first half to counter with, but... You know, he didn't. Uh, he he did what he did, and uh, they they didn't live up to uh, Spartak and Zenit, and and were severely uh, outclassed on the night. Hani, what do you think about Alexis Becker Becker so far? I think domestically he's he's performing quite well, but I mean, obviously, having said that, Loco have had two nil nil draws in a row against Ural and Kimki, but. I'm I'm just not quite sure what to make of him. I know he's only twenty, and of course you need to preface any any conversation with a a player that young and b a new signing that he he, he needs a bedding in period. He needs patience, but he, he was highly rated, and he he just looked a little bit outclassed by by Lazio on the night. What what do you think about Becca Becca more in general, not just on uh, Thursday evening? Yeah, I think the most important fact about him is that uh, RFN broke the news of his transfer, so he is destined to be a success in life. But um, purely <laughs> considering on-pitch matters, from what I've read um, and from what I've seen, he seems like a nice player. A lot of locomotive fans seem to have a positive opinion on him. They think that he has uh, hit the ground running as compared to a lot of their new signings because they've overhauled really quickly, a lot quickly than all of us expected. And a lot of those players have gelled to varying degrees. Um, but yeah, I, I think we need to give him some time to adapt into Nikolic's system, into Nikolic's beliefs, which seem to be changing on their own, um, which is another tangent. But yeah, I, I think once we once he figures out, once the manager figures out who to partner back up, back up with, who should be playing behind him, who should be playing ahead of him, what sort of role, defined role he should be given, I think we'll um, start to see him really shine because 
despite the limited adaptation period, despite the presence of just like I don't know what it is with Nikolic, he or new Nikolic, uh, a new loco. They have a completely different backline every game. Their midfielders are different every game. It's like they're I don't know rolling a dice and deciding who to put at centre back, um, and that's just tough for any player to to adapt to. But I think with time we'll uh, we'll start to see that you know he's pretty good. I think he's he started okay domestically. I think he's he's shown flashes that he's a good player. Um, I think he he's going to be good at um, breaking press. It looks like he's good. He's got a quick turn of pace, even um, quite agile on the ball. But uh, yeah, last night he he was he was not so good. There was a there was a point last night um, in the first half, James. You may have seen this where he had the ball within Loco's own half, and he he played a back pass. Yeah, and the camera he didn't have any of the players who were there in shot. I just assumed it was going straight to a defender, but it, it went straight to a Lazio forward. And and they should have made it, and that was very soon after the second goal, I believe. Um, it, it should have been three 0 very quickly out there from that, and uh, it was two big blocks from Baranov and Pablo, I think, who saved his bacon. But uh, you know, he's it's, it's got to adapt. But I think I think there's there's definitely a talented player there. It's just getting him getting him in, embedded in the team and system. It, you know, off the pitch, it looks like it's him and Andorra in a sort of palling up. Um, so hopefully those two can help each other adapt and, and get used to playing in, in Russia. Yeah, I think I don't think he had the great. I don't think he had the greatest of games. I'm, I must say that he he was fine. Uh, he gave it away in some dangerous positions, and then just apart from that, was a little bit of a passenger. But I think perhaps, like you've both you've both alluded to, it's maybe finding the right partnerships. Nikolic, I agree, Hanu is is rotating far more than. You expect him to. He, he he really settled upon a system and then kept that system, kept yeah. that personnel, and that was why local went on such a good run. It was that consistency, they're getting that knowledge together of playing with each other on a regular basis. Um, now he's partly, of course, having to change it due to injury, uh, and Toshka, Makiev, Rebush, Teknizian, and Ziluish and others are all out injured. Murillo as well. Um, so having. A midfield of Kulikov, Maradishvili, and Bekar Bekar of what, 20, 21, and 22, I think, off the top of my head, um, against Lazio, managed by Maurizio Sari with Luis Alberto in there, is just a little bit of a uh, 20, 21, 23, sorry, is a little bit of a recipe for disaster. And that's nothing against Kulikov, Maradishvili, or Bekar Bekar in, in, uh, as people, as footballers. It's just because of Basic, Cataldi and Alberto's quality and managed by Sarri, it's it's that midfield battle where where the game's won or lost. And I just the, the really desperately missed Baranov in particular in there to to add that little bit of steel and experience that he brings because Baranov on his day is is an absolutely brilliant midfielder. I think in my opinion, he is the best Russian defensive midfielder. Um still only twenty five and that was Really keenly shown last year when he was injured for that long, long period towards the start of the season. Um, Bekar Bekar, as you said, Hanu, he was, it was, um, and that, that exclusive was announced by RFN, but unfortunately, uh, midfielders whose exclusives were announced by RFN don't necessarily have the best of records. Of course, Abdul Abdi- Aziz Tete, his transfer to Dinamo was <laughs> announced by RFN, and he's now. Since his one year, Dinamo has only played seven games in three years at Jaziantep and Vijdev Loc in Turkey and Poland, respectively. So hopefully Bakar Bakar can, can fall, fare better than him and is certainly already a far more talented player anyway. But David, any any last words on Lokomotiv? Anything that really particularly stood out to you on the game? Do you think... Um, do you think that they were just outclassed on the night, as we've said, by what was a superior Lazio side who took four points off Zenit in the Champions League last year? Yeah, I, I think that was it. Um, you know, Loco have started their group, you know, their bottom. They've got one point off the, off the two games. Um, they started with two two tough fixtures, Marseille at home. Marseille outclassed them as well, for the most part. Um, they... 
you know, Marseille had plenty of chances to, to win that game uh, and didn't, you know, uh, both who got the late goal. I think uh, the the two Galatasaray games seemingly are going to be, you know, crunch games, you know. It's such a tight group. There's no weak, you know, quote unquote weak team in this group, but, you know, Galatasaray, Loco, uh, Marseille and Napoli uh, and Lazio, you know, it's four in theory, strong teams and like you know, so far, so us without having seen Galatasaray, the Loco are coming off as the weakest team. So it's it's going to be tough for them. We've seen them grind out results. You know, they they pulled off a couple of excellent performances in the Champions League last year uh, against uh, Bayern and Atletico. So um, I was hopeful they could do it again this year, and, and maybe they still will. But uh, yeah, they've got to, they've got to pull out some some results against Galatasaray. That's for sure. Yeah, this is a. It's just a really interesting group. I know we've said it before, but like you've got the fan bases where it's just, it's like a battle of absolute nutters. <laughs> like Galatasaray's speaks for itself. Um, Marseille's you've got the, that absolutely crazy crazy bunch of ultras. Yeah, Lazio well, are some of the most crazy right wing fascists, and then San Paoli and Sarri is the managers, and then you've just got mm-hmm. Loco, who are just like a little bit of a boring family club with a little bit of a bald, boring manager and. Yeah, it's not. I, I don't mean to have it go against lo- Loco here because, ironically, Loco or anything but Loco, they're a little bit calm and and collected and have actually, to be their credit and the point I'm getting at, have a long term plan in place both on and off the pitch. Um, so it's it's actually a compliment more than anything. It's just a really intriguing group. Like you say, it's really hard to pick any team who is outstandingly better than the others or vice versa, outstandingly worse. It's it's very tight. I'm I'm personally astounded that Galatasaray have managed to keep two clean sheets against Marseille and uh, Lazio with the DeAndre Yedlin and Patrick Van Arnholt at fullback because they're both very good going forwards, but defensively, for the large part, I mean, both excellent players were all over the place. Hanu, uh, any last words from yourself on Loco before moving on to the under-21s? Yeah, just about this group. Now, it's very interesting. It's a football heritage, as we say, with, with these four teams in it. But I think purely from what-if um, purposes or just to add that little bit of spice to it, I really, really wish Sparta would have been in this group instead of Loco because I think that would have been uh, the craziest group stage in European football history. Probably not good for uh, the health of the fans of any of those clubs, both mental and physical. But um, for the fireworks and for the social media interaction, that would have been something to behold. I think that, that's the only point I had. <laughs> well, Ali Spartak do have Legia, where they, they have that historic rivalry. And another another club. I mean, the Europa League is... is it's easy to say because we cover it a lot, but the Europa League is genuinely far more fascinating competition than the Champions yeah. League will ever be. But it's also, unfortunately, a competition where you just look at the clubs and at least 50% of them have, an, have a bunch of absolute fascist right-wing nutters. And it is, it's yeah. a shame. I mean, this group, I said before, three out of the four clubs have got that. And then you've got Loco, where it's just Ilya eating like hot dogs and stuff, taking pictures of Peugeots <laughs> yeah. outside the ground. It's very wholesome. <laughs> it's really wholesome. Yeah. It, but, it's your right, I think. Sorry to cut you off again. I think <laughs> the Champions League is not as interesting, but it's very gentrified. Um, it's a very palatable product. It seems like uh, even the tempers of all the clubs are a lot more constrained in the Champions League. Whereas the Europa League is a lot more fun, a lot more intriguing, but we see a lot of like nasty incidents as was with both of those Prague clubs that have covered themselves in anything but glory. Um and a lot of things like that, which is which is really sad to see, honestly. Yeah, yeah, it is sad to see. It, obviously, away from from the jokes and and that, it is unfortunate that incidents have occurred throughout the years from these sections of support, and it's something, in my opinion, that may not be a popular popular opinion because people love to see the old the old displays and the TIFOs and and like the fans being in control of the clubs but you've got football fans and these people in my opinion they're not football fans because they show up their club yep. they show up real football fans by the way that they go on by the way that they act um there was reports of 
on Fnatic to RU of some Spartak fans getting in some trouble outside the gate, outside the ground on, on Thursday. And it wasn't actually the Spartak fans causing trouble. Um, it was people coming towards them because obviously what happened in 2016 was a disgrace. But because of what happened in 2016, you have families, like people... Most people who go like who go to games in Russia are, are are by and large just families. It's a very family orientated atmosphere outside of the ultra zens, and that's what was the case with Spartak in Napoli. And there's, I've seen reports of of them having not not nothing major, but like getting slightly intimidated and and like and and, and shouted at and so on. Where the there was little kids who was quite scared, and it's because of this reputation, and it just needs to stop. It needs to be removed from the game um but uh anyway to end that tangent and a little bit of a rant david we had the under 21 russia squads announced this week a little bit later than usual yeah uh, i'll i've got some goalkeeper stuff so we'll come back to the goalkeeper shall we first and just uh, evaluate so i pulled up a few extra players so uh, okay so errors and errors leading to goal in the last three years so first of october 2018 to today Kozhikov, 13 in 69 matches. Not terrible. Kritsiuk, 69 times. Kritsiuk, 12 and 59 matches. This is all competitions as well. No. Uh, Shunin, 18 in 115 matches. Uh, Belenov, 18 in 104 matches. Dupin, 24 in 104 matches. Akinfeyev, 23 in 128 matches. Uh, Maximenko, 31 in 128 matches. Safonov, 29 in 123 matches. And Guillerme, 42 in 147 matches. So Guillerme, yeah, the worst by an extra 11 errors in the last three years. Mm. That is a lot, but also played a lot more games. It would be interesting to see, I mean, as if that one metric is the be all and end all, but it would be interesting to see per game or per ninety mm. metrics yeah, yeah, upon it. Terrible. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like Shunin's were pretty pretty solid. I mean that's that's what you get from Anton Shunin. I think Shunin is yeah. the most solid and consistent goalkeeper in the league in terms of just that, of of getting like the average seven out of ten. You know exactly what you get every time he's between the sticks. He may not be magnificent pulling out some of the saves that you'll see from a Safanov or a Maximenko or Guilherme in the in the Spartak local derby. Yeah. But he's uh, just so Max solid. Him and Akinfeir for sure would come off at the top. Yeah. But yeah, that was I just thought we'd uh, come back to that. Uh, and it, well, maybe next interesting... time someone accuses us of being anti <laughs> here, maybe just pull that out. <laughs> well, it, it is that in itself is interesting because you, you look at Per ninety metrics, I can favor and tune in are statistically the best. Why I can favor and tune in statistically the best? Well, one of the reasons is because they use their experience to the benefit of their team. Mm. They're the two most experienced goalkeepers in Russia by quite some distance, both in terms of age and caps amassed. Well, I'd be interested to see who still makes all these mistakes. Mm. I'd be interested to see. I didn't close. I closed it now, but. Um... I have a feeling if I checked a lot of tune ins errors may have come in the last couple of years. I feel like it's it seems to have ramped up recently the amount of errors he's made, but maybe that's an unfounded uh, mm. theory. But uh, we'll do that another time. Uh, but yeah, the under twenty ones uh, fairly unchanged. Uh, you know, the core squad is quite similar, but there's a few new names and old names. Uh, so the goalkeepers are unchanged. Akatsev from Krasnodar, Borisko from Baltica, and Burachov from Dynamo. In defence, we've got Bozhinov from Kimki, Karmaev from uh, Kuban, Prokin from Sochi, Litvinov from Spartak after his great performance against Napoli, uh, Sibyanov from Lokomotiv, uh, Stepanov from Arsenal Tua, Kornyushin from Krasnodar make, gets his first call-up. Kuzmichov from Ural gets his first call up, and Leon Klassen, who currently plays for Tyrol in Austria, um, with his first call up. Uh, I know he's been involved with the under 19s and 18s in the past, but this is his first uh, at this stage. But he's playing regularly in the Austrian top flight, so um, and he's a left back, so Stepanov needs some competition there, so and he'll get that. Uh, midfield, we've got Ignatov from Spartak again after his his goal in, in Napoli. Uh, Former from Rostov, his first call up. Karapuzov from Ahmat, 
uh, Husevich from Arsenal Tula, Kravtsov from Zenit, Kravtsov from Krasnodar, Maridashvili from Loco, Mukin from Siska dropping down from the senior squad because uh, obviously Mukin uh, had never played at any level under 21s uh, and jumped straight to the senior team uh, prior to the Euros. Um, so this will be his first cap. Uh, Prutsev from Krilia and Umyarov from Spartak. And then up front, we've got Suleimanov from Novgorod. Tukavin dropping down from the seniors also from, from Dinamo. And uh, Yakovlev from Siska gets his first call up, uh, replacing Agalarov, who, as we know, went up to the, the senior squad. Um, so, yeah, a few new names. Uh, I'm intrigued to see the new defenders. You know, three new defenders in there. Kornushin, I think Kornushin, I don't know if, well, about you two, but I think he's been fairly good for Krasnar at right back uh, this season when he's had to play. I think he's made four or five appearances for them. Um, and he's one of the younger players. I think he's only 19, so he'd be one of the younger players in the squad. But, uh, yeah, uh, interesting squad, and we'll see how they get on. They've got Northern Ireland at home uh, in, at the Kimpti Arena, and then they go away to Lithuania. So, uh, in theory, should hopefully be two wins, uh, but we'll see how they get on. Um, quickly to end, speaking of Krasnodar's off fullbacks, I don't know why they did it, but it was really weird to see Christian Ramirez play right back and then Vilhena play left back against Sochi at the weekend. Um, for those who didn't catch it, Sochi, uh, Krasnodar beat Sochi 3 0 and actually had two men sent off, both Chernikov and Spajic, um, during the course of the game. And yeah, it was just uh, while you were on the topic of of Krasnodar fullbacks in Cornution. It was really weird to see Ramirez moved over and then Vilhena playing um left back while Cornution was was down on the bench. Um but anyway it's I would like to also hear how many players have done a Mukin where they don't play at all for the unders and then get their first senior call up and then drop back down to the under twenty ones because mm. presumably people like Rooney Maybe in England when he was 16, obviously played for England. Yeah. Um, perhaps didn't get the under-21 call-up, but he would never have then dropped back down. Zaharian, he made his debut for Russia what, uh, having just, literally just turned 18, but yeah. had still played for like the under-21s three times beforehand. It's definitely a rarity. I mean, even you think back to Theo Walcott. Um I don't. I, th- I imagine actually, even though he got called up at sixteen, I don't think he actually played until he was yeah, twenty-one. But yeah, you don't get it very often. Players go straight to the seniors for England. I'm thinking maybe Bellingham did it, um, just because he was recently maybe quite because he was very young. But uh, don't uh, don't quote me on that. That's just a, a guess. But yeah, it's uh, not very often you see players do that. And you know, I mean, look, you've got Mario Dushvili, Mukin, Umyarov, Perutsev, Kravtsov. That's five midfielders who are playing fairly regularly, centre mids, and that, that's five good players of all similar qualities, I think. Um, and then you've got like Natal who can go pervert forward as well. So you've got some really good midfielders at this level, and uh, you know Miaros, the captain for this team, and you know, yeah, his performances for Spartak, I think, is really a player, um, especially in his performance for Spartak against Napoli the other night. Yeah, sort of underline why he's going to be so important in filling in the the Zobnin void. I don't, I don't know how long how long Zobnin out for. Hanu, do we know? Um, I think he's out until at least one or two games after the international break. So I think end of October, November. Okay, maybe. so not maybe. too long. But you know, Umiaro is going to be crucial yeah, during that period for you. And uh, I think he's I think he's really good, personally. Yeah, yeah, very good footballer. Um, we're quickly just getting to the end of the pod now. Uh, to finish off, though, I've got a little fun stat. Um, Andre Arshavin was very close to actually joining Mukin in in that in that sort of collective of footballers. He made his senior debut just a couple of months after he made his under twenty ones debut in two thousand and two. But David, first, who do you think that Arshavin made his full debut against for Zenit in two thousand? Uh, I think I actually know this. I think I've seen it yeah. on Twitter. It's, it's Brad. At least 500 times. Yeah, it's Bradford, isn't it? <gasps> yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> I've seen the clip, yeah. yeah. Bradford. I was At thinking, least 500 times. I was wondering actually it. if uh, Golovin and Chernoff, do you remember when, um, was it Capello? Gave them both a debut or whoever it was. Like, no, just yeah. plucked them out from the Cisco reserves and 
played them both for Russia that weird time. It was really weird. I wonder if Alan Zagoev, because I don't know this, but I think Alan, like Alan Zagoev had a really blistering start, right? Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. I don't know. Spain have called up a 17-year-old from Barcelona who played for the U16s for Spain, and now he's directly been given a call up for the senior team. Mm. He's got like five appearances, but they called him up anyway. Uh, That's yeah. the like state of Spanish football. Zagoev did. He did. He he played for Russia before he's he played for the 21s. Oh, there you go. Um, because he was like it was his first season as Siska after he, after he after he first joined. Um, yeah, from what into, was then Korea. All into I've just seen. So uh, it's a rare occurrence. But not but sure enough. I would like to see if anyone has ever in across the world as well has ever actually had that call up, and then been omitted from the squad and played for the under twenty ones again. That must be so rare, very very rare. But anyway, that's the end of this week's pod. Um. Thank you, David and Hanu, for joining me. And thank you to all the listeners for listening, as as, as always. Uh, we'll be back towards the normal time next week, covering more normal games. Uh, coming up soon is, of course, the international break again, the second of three, I think, that are going to be in, in subsequent months quite close together. So we will be covering all of that and the RPL as usual. But this has been the RFN podcast. Goodbye for now. Идет футбольный матч, летит над полем мяч. Идет футбольный матч, летит над полем мяч. Веди его, беги, точнее его ударь. Но мяч берет в ноги решительный вратарь. Не напрасно футбольное поле самых ловких и смелых плечов. Здесь нужны тренировка и воля, быстрота, увлечение, расчет.